can we all agree that was the game of the weekend? Yes. Like, yeah. I mean, uh, by a slim, slim margin, yeah. mm-hmm. but that felt like, to me, the game of the weekend. Yes. Because I, I was up in Sacramento, and I went to go get a cup of coffee across the street at, like, 10 o'clock in the morning, and there was already Kings fans outside. There were people driving cars with Kings, like, written down the side of it. And to have that kind of atmosphere, it's like, okay, the atmosphere, is the hype going to live up? It absolutely did. We had 24 lead changes in this one. Perk, you picked the Kings heading into this series. What did you learn from them in game one? Well, I learned a lot, a lot from Mike Brown. Like every time he was on Mike or you interviewed him, he talked about pace and letting it fly. Mm. And so I'm watching the Kings play, and I'm like, how much faster do you want them to play? <laughs> and he wanted more. This is a team that ranked 12th in pace this season, first in offensive efficiency. So when I look at what they were doing, they were pushing the tempo to get those wide open looks. They were making the, those uh, the, the Golden State Warriors run, run up and down the floor and use those puppies. And what we have to realize is this, is that the Golden State Warriors, probably over the last, what, seven or eight years, have been in multiple NBA finals, mm-hmm. won multiple NBA championships, meaning that they have a lot of miles on their legs. And while Mike Brown was on that bench, he know that it takes a lot to get to that point. And so when he's telling this young ball club and De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk and Keegan Murray and Harrison Barnes and those guys to run, 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 push the pace, it's for that reason right there in particular, so that they could get good looks, great looks at the basket and play to their advantage. Mm. No, I I agree with Perk. I I think when you look at Mike Brown ran the defense for the Golden State Warriors, so he knows how they are most vulnerable. He knows how they are often attacked. He knows where he had to stop and put put plugs into some holes. And so my, my biggest thing is this. You give up 71 points in the second half if you're the Golden State Warriors. Now, we know about the shooting. Everyone loves the three-point shots. Everyone loves Steph and Clay, the Splash Brothers. But what made them special and different is their defense. Mm. And that's what was missing on the road the most was their defense. Now, do I believe that this Kings team has a chance to beat them? 1,000%. But if we're talking about Warriors, if they don't improve their defense, they're not going to make a run. If they don't improve their defense, they're not going to get past this series. Do I believe that their defense will improve? But 71 points in the second half right. to this team on the road, that's just not going to get it done in the postseason. Particularly when you know that this is one of the most offensively electric yeah. teams in the NBA, the Sacramento Kings have been. But, Perk, you mentioned what, what Mike Brown was doing to challenge his team, right? Saying if you, He literally said, if you, I was listening into one of their huddles, and he said, if you need to come out, if you can't keep up with the pace, you need to let me know. You need to tell me, because I know y'all are working hard, but we need to go even faster. So imagine what I kind of learned watching this game, right, is to have to keep that up and also have the, just this relentless level of focus on the defensive end on Steph Curry. That is not easy. And De'Aaron Fox, he talked about that after game one. Just trying to be as disruptive as possible while guarding if not the best player in the world, uh, the best player to ever, you know, jump shot wise, shoot a basketball, not just off the catch, but off the dribble. The guy's probably one of the craftiest players to ever touch the ball. Um, just to be able to just try to be disruptive for me, I think is uh, is the biggest step. And I think that's kind of something that I'm, I don't, I don't care to prove to anybody else, but I want to prove to myself that, that I can go out there and just try to hound, you know, some of the best guards in the league. Our fabulous statistician, Matt Williams, just texted me this. Fox tied Harrison Barnes for the most distance covered in the game. And that's 100% because he's running around trying to keep up with (laughs) Steph Curry the entire. There's not been a lot of firsts at this point in Steph Curry's career, right, when he's coming to the postseason. He has never trailed 2-0. You can see on your screen there in all of his career playoff series. So let's see if it's a first tonight. Uh, Before game two between the Warriors and the Kings, we also have the Sixers. They're trying to take a 2-0 lead over the Nets. Philly never trailed in game one, won comfortably 121-101. They got 20-plus point nights from both Joel Embiid, James Harden, also Tobias Harris. Double-digit favorites to win again tonight's game over Brooklyn. 
So with more on Philadelphia, we are joined now by our senior writer, Ramona Shelburne. Hey, Ramona. So I am curious here, without Embiid, the Sixers, they, they tried to change their second unit a little bit here, and that's something that we've talked about. How are they going to look when Embiid is not on the floor? What more can you tell us? They were great. I mean, James Harden has got something going with Paul Reed, and they've found a, they've found a way of playing together that once you're comfortable with James Harden and he knows how to facilitate with you, that they have really got that going. And I think that's what's happened for Philadelphia in the past. When Joel Embiid is not on the court, they just die. Those lineups just do, they don't function at all. And in this in this game, they Joel Embiid was great passing out of the double teams. They're 11 for 19 when they double him, and the 24 times they doubled him. And when he was off the floor, the Sixers held their own. And I think that's that's critical in this series because you saw what happened last year. They go up three nothing to Toronto. Toronto gets a game. Joel Embiid gets hurt in game three. Gets a concussion in game six. Right. This is the first two games of the second round. You got to end this now. You know what you're going to get from Joel Embiid. He's been reliable. He's been dependable. Yep. It's about what you can get when he is not on the floor. And so far, at least in yep. this series, we've seen some hints and inklings. They may be figuring something out here. Ramona, thank you so much. Game in the Valley last night. We were treated to the full Russell Westbrook experience. We're going to pick this one up in the fourth quarter because it was an excellent game. Came down to the wire here. But watch this. Eric Gordon. Pulls up for three. No good, but Russ comes soaring in. Secures the rebound. Clears out. Sets up Kawhi Leonard. That's cash. Gives the Clippers. Extends their lead there. Another look just comes flying to secure that board. And then Kawhi Leonard doing what he does. Playing every minute but two in the second half. Devin Booker the other way. 20 seconds left, huge defensive play here. Not only does he get the block, he bounces it off of Devin Booker. The awareness to be able, the body awareness, the Clippers get the win, 115-110. And Woj, when the Clippers signed Westbrook, you were on this show, and you talked about how they had a very specific vision for Russ. I mean, was, was this it? Well, it wasn't <laughs> the three for 19 part sure, to start part. the game. Uh, but late in the game, all the plays Russell Westbrook made down the stretch and listen they brought him in offensively to be a, a playmaker to be a distributor uh, and certainly that was a vision with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard and, and cer certainly last night uh, this was uh, for for the Suns uh, or against the Suns especially when they're going to play in a close game they've got to steal those close games you could make the case Phoenix has four of the five best players uh, on the court uh, at any time with the starters but what Westbrook did down the stretch and the way he impacted winning that is why you bring him there and I think Ty Lue said it during the game he talked to Russell Westbrook when his shots weren't falling right there's far more you're going to do for us than make shots and he did it in the last two minutes Rich Russ wasn't on your list necessarily of others because at this point we, we still consider him a star real quick what did you see from him well it's the the Russ haters and the Russ lovers they are still super confused about this again the three <laughs> for 19 so the haters are just like oh he's shooting like that again but I, I will say this Russ all the things that we saw from us we expect from Russ even some of the shooting if I had to critique a little bit it's the three for 19 if you get rid of maybe four or five of those shots sure. he has too much much talent around them. Those can be assists, which we know he's one of the greatest of all time. That's my one critique, but Russ did everything perfectly to right. finish that game. His fingerprints were just all mm -hmm. over that game. And then Kawhi Leonard, he had 38 points. Janae, my friend, what did you see from Kawhi? I think Kawhi Leonard really heard us talking about how the Phoenix Suns, they have all the mid-range assassins, and he took that personally because look at his shot chart right here. He had no makes in the restricted area, which meant he was going for the mid-range. So many here, a couple daggers from three. I loved all of that. 17 out of his 38 points came in ISO, the third most this year, and I'll show you exactly how he had it, how he got it done. Run me my tape, producer Kathy, birthday girl, baby. All right, in this pick and roll, this is what I love to see, the physicality. Low management, he invented it, but he makes the most of it. Look at that, he initiates, I call that a blind shot mid-range because you lose sight of the basket and he knocks it down, but this right here is advanced reading of the defense. He's getting to his bag off the dribble rhythm. Normally you're stuck right here. Instead, he has the awareness to step through and he's able to have that beautiful touch in the mid-range, not restricted area, over DeAndre Ayton to finesse that right in. This man, 
He may not smile, he might go, uh, uh, whatever, but he is a killer. He is an assassin, and I think he took it personally last time, Malika. Janae, thank you. And the Suns, they're still trying to figure out, right, their clutch groove a little bit here. And that showed up with how many touches down the stretch Kevin Durant had. What did you see here, Zach? Yeah, they didn't give the ball to Kevin Durant enough, but I think it's worth looking at what happened when they did. Here's a pick and roll. Kawhi gets over the screen. That's annoying to have him behind you. Zubats is up, and look at Terrence Mann off of Chris Paul, daring Chris Paul to beat him, and then Aiden Bills out the possession with the mid-range jumper. They're making it hard on KD. Here again, Kawhi, it looks like he has a window right there, but that's not really a window when Kawhi's behind you. Zoo's up that high, and again, Here's Terrence Mann saying, beat us, Chris Paul, and instead it goes to Aiden. To me, those are the two touches, by the way. That's it. Right. We just saw the two touches. That's the whole thing. They need to get KD the ball more, obviously. But I think the bigger story for me of the game was that Chris Paul was two for eight. It did not look comfortable on offense for any of the game, and they cannot. I mean, they had six guys play more than ten minutes. That's it. Only one guy off the bench even saw double-figure minutes. That means you can't afford a two of eight game from Chris Paul. Well, and that's been the question for the Suns, right? The season is their depth. Yeah, and, you know, you, you talk about their execution late in the game, and you talk to Western Conference coaches, even before the Kevin Durant trade, what always worried them about the Suns, even if he felt they were uh, a, maybe a little under-talented before KD, was that they would execute late in games, and that's what scared teams in the postseason. And now you have you know, the greatest offensive weapon in the league in Kevin Durant. I think it's still going to be a calling card for the Suns team. It's going to be interesting to see how it goes. The Clippers certainly made it that way by stealing games. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.